Hello, Trinity Tigers. Welcome to the second webinar of the Tiger Enrichment Lifelong Learning Series, Senior Service for our Trinity Alumni. I'm Leslie Longworth, class of 1988, and the president of your Trinity University Alumni Association. It's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Professor David Crockett. David is born in Fort Bragg, North Carolina in 1963. He's often asked if he's related to the famous Davy Crockett, and he says with certainty that he is not a direct descendant, but a first cousin five times removed. So he entered Georgetown University in 1981, receiving his Bachelor's of Arts degree in government in May of 1985, receiving a graduate, uh, excuse me, graduating with cum laude. He was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army and served as a communications officer in the Federal Republic of Germany with the 3rd Infantry Division and at Fort Hood with the 13th Corps Support Command. He resigned his regular Army commission at the rank of captain in late 1991 and entered the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. He received his Master of Public Affairs in 1993, winning the Emmett S. Redford Award for Outstanding Scholarship for his master's report called Approaching Judgment, The Religious Fight and the Republican Dilemma. He then began doctoral work in political science with the Department of Government at the University of Texas at Austin, receiving his Doctor of Philosophy in 1999. His dissertation, A Time to Rule, the Presidency as an Opposition Leader, won the Best Dissertation on the Presidency Prize for 1999 from the Center of Presidential Studies located at the Texas a and University. Professor Crockett has taught at Trinity <coughs> University in the Political Science Department since 1999. His primary teaching and research interests include American presidency, elections and campaigns, classical political philosophy, American political development, and American political thought. He's an expert on U.S. presidential elections. He's the author of Running Against the Brain, How the Opposition Presidents Win the White House, and Opposition Presidency, Leadership and the Constraints of History, both published by Texas A&M University Press as part of their ongoing series on presidential leadership. Today, Dr. Crockett has the intriguing um, attempt to explain to us and bring clarity to the various dynamics that lie behind this incre uh, incredibly diverse and fascinating 2016 presidential election. So along the right side of your screen, you have the ability to type in questions during this presentation, and at the end, we'll get to as many questions as time permits. So without further ado, Dr. Crockett. Thank you for that introduction and welcome to this talk on handicapping the 2016 presidential race. Unfortunately, I can't give the talk that I had planned to give when I was asked to do this several months ago. At that time, I thought that the 2016 presidential race would conform to the standards typical of most presidential races in the last 40 years. And that means that by now we would know the identity of the two major party candidates and I could focus solely on general election concerns. But of course, we don't know the identity with the two of the two candidates now, although I think we're getting pretty close. So I'm going to do three things today. I'm going to first try to explain a little about how we got where we are today. And then second, I'm going to try to lay out for you how I see the nomination race ending. And then third, I'll briefly address how to think about the general election, even though we don't know who the candidates will be yet. So first, how we got to where we are today. Historically, this race is very unusual. After 1968, our nomination system was dramatically changed by the McGovern-Fraser Commission. This was a commission in the Democratic Party that sought to open up and democratize the nomination process after Hubert Humphrey got the Democratic nomination despite not running in any primaries. So he went from a system in which most of the delegates required to secure a party's nomination were acquired at the state level party conventions to one in which most of them were acquired through popular vote primaries like what we have today. And although it took a few election cycles to work out how this system would function, by the 1980s, people understood the new rules of the game. And the new rules of the game were that Iowa and New Hampshire had a disproportionate impact on the nomination race. Doing well in those two states was essential to victory, and early losses in those two states usually meant that money and support quickly dried up for the candidates. 
And usually by Super Tuesday, we were left with one candidate standing. And so we knew months in advance of the national conventions who the candidates would be. The one clear exception to this pattern was the 2008 battle between President Obama and Hillary Clinton, which went all the way to June before being settled. Now what's happening in the Democratic Party today is not that unusual. We saw a very quick winnowing process that left most of Hillary Clinton's competitors as early victims of her juggernaut. And that's partially because she was the one clear choice of the party establishment. In fact, the only significant competition she has faced is from an independent socialist from Vermont, someone who is not even a formal member of her party. Bernie Sanders has been able to capture the enthusiasm of Democrats who are disaffected from the mainstream party. And he's done a good job delaying Clinton from reaching the magic number of delegates that she needs to secure her party's nomination, which is 2383. After this week's primaries, Clinton has earned the pledged support of 1,580 delegates to the National Convention, which is still about 800 shy of the necessary majority. And with a little more than 1,200 delegates to go, she'd need to average about 67% the rest of the way to win the nomination outright from Sanders. So she can't do that with pledged delegates. Her real advantage is with the so-called superdelegates. Now these superdelegates are not superheroes, but they were created by the Democrats after 1980 to allow sitting Democratic Party office holders and state and national level party officials to be voting delegates at the National Convention, unpledged to any candidate. There, if they thought the party was going to make some horrendous decision like nominating a socialist, they could use their voting power to influence the result. And there are 714 of these folks at stake, and most of them are party establishment figures who support Clinton over Sanders. And that's why Clinton has a prohibitive advantage in this race. Because instead of, instead of being short of the nomination by over 800 delegates, if we count the superdelegates who have already pledged themselves to her so far, she's really only short about 236. And that means she has to win less than 30% of the remaining delegates to secure the nomination, which is a piece of cake. So bottom line, although the process in the Democratic Party is going longer than Clinton would like, she's about to be the presumptive nominee. So where the fun stuff is taking place is in the Republican Party. And the story in the GOP this year is not the protracted nomination process, but the reason for the protracted nomination process, and that's Donald Trump. Trump has been the headline for about 10 months now, and his picture will be on the cover of whatever journalistic accounts of this election are written. He's been an incredibly disruptive force in the process, challenging all sorts of norms the experts have considered sacred rules for decades. Political scientists have done a good job over the years trying to understand the elements that go into a successful nomination fight, and these elements boil down to an easily understood shortlist. Successful candidates can raise a lot of money. Successful candidates can run a continent-sized campaign, and most important, Successful candidates can do those things because they have the support of the party establishment, broadly defined as sitting office holders and allied interest groups and opinion shapers. And over the years, all successful Republican candidates have enjoyed the support of the party and been able to raise money and establish a nationwide campaign that allows them to weather an early primary loss because they have the resources to keep on fighting. From Reagan through Romney, they all had existing coalitional strength. Trump does not. He challenges the received wisdom about what it takes to win the nomination. His fundraising compared to his opponents has been minuscule. His organization has been a developing process at best. And he clearly does not have the support of the larger party. Very few elective leaders have endorsed him. And with the exception of some elements in the talk radio field and some larger right-wing media establishment types, he doesn't enjoy the support of most Republican interest groups. So why is he in first place? Whole dissertations will be written explaining the Trump phenomenon, but here are some possible explanations for his durability. And it's a durability that has surprised many pundits who really saw him in the vein of a Herman Cain from 2012, more of a flash in the pan. So first, uh, Trump has clearly captured the loyalty of voters who are disaffected from traditional party politics, especially the so-called Republican establishment, whatever that term means now. In part, this is a problem Republicans have made for themselves. 
in the wake of the less than stellar end of the Bush presidency and the start of the Obama presidency, we saw the rise of the Tea Party movement. We also saw a renewed effort to challenge sitting Republican office holders who were seen as too moderate for newly energized conservative insurgents. We typically call these rhinos. This movement cost Republicans the Senate in 2010 as these insurgents ran less than stellar candidates in winnable states like Nevada, Colorado, and Delaware. But they did win back control of the House in a major league shellacking, promising to do all sorts of things once they obtained power. And then the same thing happened in 2014 as the Republicans increased their numbers in the House and took back control of the Senate. But in making certain promises to voters about what they would do if they took control of Congress, these insurgents forgot about the constraints of a separation of power system. They forgot that voting to rescind Obamacare does not get rid of it if the president has a veto pen. They forgot that Congress can stop a president from doing a lot of things, but they can't prosecute a positive agenda without veto-proof majorities. And so the voters that put them in power got impatient and frustrated and turned on them. And Trump, who promises to take a wrecking ball to the system, represents that rage, along with Ted Cruz. But given a choice between Cruz and Trump, Trump represents the bigger wrecking ball. But the problem, I think, is that the wrecking ballers have no good alternative. The separation of power system will still be in place in 2017, and whether it's Donald Trump or Ted Cruz, he will still have to confront the same barriers erected by our checks and balances system. So it's not clear to me how either of these guys will do anything other than disappoint their fan base, since the current member of membership of Congress is unlikely to change that dramatically. Paul Ryan will still be Speaker of the House, and Mitch McConnell will still be the Senate Majority Leader if Trump or Cruz wins the presidency. But there's no question that Trump has capitalized on years of frustration by some, focused on the Republican Party's inability to reverse the New Deal order. Trump has also been able to sustain media attention that would be the envy of any presidential candidate. Every time it looks like the story is going to move in another direction, Trump says or does something to wrench the story back to himself. And he gets away with saying things that would, have been, that would destroy the, candidate, uh, the campaign of any traditional candidate. And that's because his fan base is fiercely loyal to him. The Trump phenomenon has been perpetuated by the conservative media, some of whom have fed this appetite for destruction and self-immolation on the part of an uncompromising party activist who view any hint of compromise on a long list of issues to be unacceptable. Trump also benefited from the dynamics of this particular election cycle. In previous election cycles, we have witnessed a scenario in which one or two traditional candidates competed for the nomination and then a larger group of insurgents tried to knock them out. Well, this year we saw a large number of traditional candidates compete for the nomination because the perception this cycle was that the nomination was something worth getting. This is going to be a good year for Republicans. And the result was that there were only a few genuine insurgents and Trump overwhelmed them. And the party establishment was not able to coalesce behind one candidate. They thought it might be Jeb Bush, but no one really rose up to become the prohibitive frontrunner. And the result is that Trump has never enjoyed the support of a majority of the party, but he has won more often than not because the rest of the group splits the vote. The anti-Trump vote has always been split among several candidates, allowing Trump to rack up primary victories with just a plurality of the vote, despite the fact that a majority of Republicans oppose his nomination. And that brings us then to the most interesting question, who is Trump's fan base? And a lot of work is being done now to try to understand who the Trump voters are, and we can come to some preliminary conclusions. Trump voters are unhyphenated Americans, people who define their ancestry to be American rather than identify a specific European point of origin. They are less likely to have graduated from college. They are often found in old economy jobs and have experienced a higher level of economic dysfunction as the newer global economy has left them behind. They see immigrants and minority groups, the latter of which are favored by affirmative action programs and welfare programs as threats. And therefore, there is a certain level of ethnocentrism to these voters and a suspicion of the coming majority-minority nation that the demographics indicate. These characteristics also lead to certain political and policy preferences. 
Trump supporters desire a strong leader who can shake up in Washington, leading many political scientists to argue that they have a certain bent toward authoritarianism. Trump supporters strongly support building a wall on the Mexican border, deporting all illegal immigrants currently living in the country, and banning the entrance of Muslims to the United States, leading many political scientists to argue that they also have a bent toward old-fashioned nativism. And finally, Trump supporters oppose cuts to Social Security or Medicare, and they support higher taxes on the wealthy. All of which means that Trump is not running a conservative campaign, he is running a populist campaign. He gets his largest support from non-college graduates and people making an annual income of less than $50,000 a year. In fact, in many ways, he represents a rejection of core principles long associated with the Reagan revolution. And a Trump victory would represent the end of Reagan conservatism. Trump does this while also facing extremely high negatives from women and minorities, which are the very groups the Republican Party thought it needed to appeal to after the 2012 election, when Mitt Romney won a larger percentage of the white vote than Ronald Reagan did, but Romney lost, whereas Reagan won in a land landslide. But those high negatives scare Republican Party officials who fear that a Trump candidacy will threaten their control of Congress as well as cost them the White House. And that's why there is such a strong anti-Trump movement. So that outlines where we are today. The question is, where will it end? Barring an indictment, Hillary Clinton will get the nomination with the help of Democratic superdelegates. On the Republican side, with only about 20% of the delegates left to be pick, picked, Trump's path to 1237, which is the number he needs to lock in the nomination, is very narrow, but it's doable. After Tuesday's primaries, Trump has claimed 956 delegates. So he's still short about 281, with only about 500 left to go. Cruz is at 547, Kasich is at 154, with Rubio still ahead of him at 173, even though he's not contesting. For weeks now, scholars have explained how Trump could get to 1237 by June 7th, which is the last date of the primaries in this one in California. But his path has always been very treacherous. But this is a little less so after what happened on Tuesday, because now he needs to win just over 50% of the remaining delegates. A lot rides on Indiana next week, and a series of weekly primaries over the next month, and then that California monster on June the 7th. It remains quite possible that by close of business June 7th, we will face a situation in which no Republican candidate has the necessary 1237 delegates to claim the nomination. Now, even if Trump fails to hit 1237, there's no guarantee of a convention fight. There are about 40 days between the last primary on June 7th and the start of the Republican convention on July 18th. Back in 1976, neither Ford nor Reagan had the necessary majority of delegates at the end of the primary period, but Ford took the interval between the primaries and the convention to lock down enough of the unbound and uncommitted delegates to secure the necessary majority by the time the convention started. And that's what Trump will try to do after June the 7th. There may be as many as 250 to 300 unbound delegates. These are the people who were pledged to Jeb Bush and Ben Carson and Marco Rubio, in addition to dozens of delegates chosen by states as unpledged delegates. There are at least 106 of these spread out between American Samoa, Guam, the Virgin Islands, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, and Wyoming. So the critical question is how short of 1237 Trump is on June the 7th? If he's short by a dozen delegates, I suspect it will be not hard for him to find enough to make up this a number by June 18th. If he's short by 100 delegates, then all bets are off. That's a lot of delegates to make up, and I think there will be a lot of delegates out there who are good party members who will be thinking about electability in November against Hillary Clinton, and they may not be as easy to poach. And that brings us then to old-fashioned territory. For well over a century after the 1830s, parties decided who their candidates would be at national conventions. This would often take many ballots to decide, since many state parties would nominate favorite sons to compete with individuals who had a more national reputation. 
Now, we haven't had a situation in either party where the nomination wasn't known at the end of the primary process since 1976 in the contest between Ford and Reagan. And Republicans have not had a convention that went beyond one ballot since 1948, when Thomas Dewey won the nomination. Now, I think we should be clear that if this goes to a convention fight, it will not be a brokered convention because there aren't any brokers left in the party. Back in the day, state party leaders had control over their state delegations at national conventions, and they could guarantee the candidates their ability to deliver the state as a block if they got something in return. So it was not uncommon for these leaders to use their power and their leverage in the bargaining and deal-making process that was very common at conventions. But those types of power brokers no longer exist. Who is going to tell Texas Republican delegates who they have to vote for? So what we would see is not a brokered convention, but what you could call simply an open convention or a contested convention. And that's what we'll see if Trump does not get to 1237 by July 18th. In that situation, on the first round of the voting, all the delegates have to cast their first vote for the individual they are pledged to vote for, with a few hundred unbound delegates doing whatever they want to do. If no one gets 1237 on ballot one, the delegates become free agents. The specific rules about this vary somewhat from state to state, but the general rule is that someone who is a Trump or a Cruz delegate on ballot one is free to vote however they want to on ballot two. And that's why the issue of delegate selection going on right now is so important, something Cruz has understood and Trump has only recently become aware of. It is state conventions that are attended by good Republicans that will choose the physical human beings to represent the state at the national convention. And there is quite possible that someone who really likes Cruz will be chosen to go to Cleveland, but they'll officially be a Trump delegate. So they'll do their duty on ballot one and vote for Trump, but on ballot two, they'll vote their heart or their conscience and switch to Cruz. And Cruz has a strong national organization that is thinking, thinking strategically about this, trying to make sure that people who end up in Cleveland will turn to him after ballot one. And that's why Trump really needs to lock this down before July 18th. If he goes to Cleveland shy of 1237, with a healthy majority of the party still against him, I think it's highly unlikely that he will be able to secure the nomination on ballot two or later. Now, does that mean Ted Cruz becomes the nominee? He would have the strongest claim coming in second to Trump. But Cruz will be hundreds short of 1237. So his victory depends a lot on how many Trump delegates are really closet Cruz fans. If Cruz does a good job stacking the deck state by state in his favor, then he'll do well. But Kasich will also have delegates there, and Rubio may keep his delegates. And you'll still have those unbound delegates who may be inclined to assess the situation in mid-July in terms of public opinion polling versus Hillary Clinton in November. And although Trump may look like a bad bet there, as, as he does right now, there's no guarantee Cruz will look any better. And if Cruz doesn't look good, the delegates could certainly look elsewhere for a more electable candidate or someone who will at least do the least damage to the party. And all that raises then the very arcane issue of convention rules. Both parties have a variety of rules that govern the nomination process, including convention procedures. And the most commonly mentioned rule on the Republican side is Rule 40, which currently states that you, to have your name placed in nomination, you have to have won a majority of delegates from at least eight states. And if that rule remains unchanged, then only Trump and Cruz can be placed in nomination. Now this rule is often changed to adjust it to whatever dynamics are in play that year, and many think it will be tweaked again this year. Delegates could decide to lower the threshold to allow anyone who has any delegate support to be placed in nomination, and that would open the door for people like John Kasich and Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, Ben Carson, and even Rand Paul, Carly Fiorina, and Mike Huckabee, who have one delegate each. And if there is an open convention that runs past one ballot, with real discussion about electability in November, these doors would be open. Now what about someone who did not run in the primaries, the famous white knight like Speaker Paul Ryan? In theory, unbound delegates could look elsewhere for a savior, but it seems to me to be unlikely. Again, you'd have to change Rule 40, 
And although Rule 40 may be adjusted for this cycle, I'm not sure there's any consensus on doing away with all delegate acquisition threshold altogether. And that's what you'd have to do to get a non-candidate into nomination. Which means if things get that far, you're probably looking for someone who has already been in this race, and likely someone who was in the race long enough to have won delegates. And that would rule out people like Scott Walker, Rick Perry, or Bobby Jindal. So I think you want to watch for several things in the coming weeks. First, you want to track Trump's delegate acquisition and see if he can break through the 1237 barrier, or at least get very close to it. Second, if Trump fails to crack 1237, you want to see what's happening at the state level to see if Trump can lure enough unbound delegates in June and July to put himself over the top. And then third, pay attention to the Republican Rules Committee discussions right before the convention. That will tell you what to look for at the convention itself. And finally, please note that none of what I've talked about represents anything immoral or illegal or unethical or rigged. All of these rules and procedures are part of this process. Getting a majority of delegates is not an arbitrary rule, nor is opening up the convention to deliberation about the candidates. And any grousing about this by candidates is simply political, political rhetoric of a whining sort. So I want to conclude then with a few thoughts about what we might see in the fall. Some political scientists specialize in elections forecasting. These are colleagues of mine who do this because they think elections are predictable. Citizens tend to respond to political events in predictable ways, and that allows political scientists to construct models of elections and forecast the results, often quite reliably, months in advance of the actual event. The fact is that a significant number of voters make up their minds well before a campaign even begins. And that means the actual general election campaign can expect to impact less than 30% of the voting population. Why is this? The simple answer is partisanship. Most Americans psychologically identify with one of the two major parties, and our vote for that party represents a standing decision in its favor until we're given a compelling reason to change. It's very hard for most of us to change our party vote. We usually line up for our party, and that affiliation causes us to focus on agreeable information about our champion and de-emphasize negative information. And the result is that each party starts out with a fairly large base of support. Even in historical landslides like Franklin Roosevelt in 1936, Lyndon Johnson in 1964, and Ronald Reagan in 1984, the loser still won roughly 40% of the vote. The second reason elections are predictable is that many voters treat an election as a performance evaluation. If they are doing well, we, re we hire them. If not, we replace them but we tend to evaluate performance through our partisan lens. So political scientists search for systematic aspects of presidential elections that indicate how people will vote. And I'm gonna to touch briefly on two of these factors. First, there's incumbency. Incumbency is seen as an opportunity for any president running for re-election. The power to take advantage of his office to shape events in his favor. This advantage is partially one of inertia. Incumbents get the benefit of the doubt. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. More incumbents win than lose, and no incumbent who has a job approval rating of 50% has ever lost. But this advantage is greatest with presidents who are seeking a second consecutive term for their party, like Obama in 2012. That advantage disappears if a candidate is seeking to extend party control of the presidency to a third term or more, like Hillary Clinton in 2016. So this variable obviously favors the Republican Party this year. The second factor is the election year economy. The general idea is that the economy conditions the public mood toward the incumbent party. A strong economy means a good mood and a tendency to overlook vulnerabilities. A weak economy leads to a surly mood and a tendency to kick the bums out. Historically, the election year economy is the primary determinant of the public's mood. And historically, presidents need to break about 2.5% GDP annualized to be confident of re-election. I haven't seen definitive numbers yet, but from what I've read, the first quarter GDP for 2016 will not be that high. So political scientists take this information and they use past elections to see what measurements indicate success, and then they construct mathematical models to predict the results. All of which might sound like hocus pocus, 
but it really makes some sense. If we treat elections like performance evaluations, then the easiest way for citizens to judge their leaders is to take stock of the state of the economy. Economic measurements that serve as indicators of how well the economy is doing, combined with job approval measurements of who is in power, which ought to account for non-economic aspects of performance, those are strongly predictive of election results. Which doesn't mean that citizens don't listen to campaign speeches or watch debates, just that it's very difficult for a speech or a debate performance or a campaign ad to change what our own experience is telling us. And if these numbers hold up, I would expect the models to predict a Republican advantage this year. Now, note one really important phenomenon here. None of these models takes account of the identity of the actual nominees. The models are all blind to the personal characteristics of the candidates. They don't recognize email scandals or inflammatory rhetoric at all. They are based purely on what political scientists call campaign fundamentals. So while the models suggest that this is a winnable year for the GOP, that assessment flies in the face of the many arguments that Trump himself is a weak general election candidate based on his sky-high negatives with many voting blocks. Now why would that be? These political science models assume a certain level of campaign competence and professionalism. They assume campaigns will be run professionally and that candidates will not do or say completely crazy things. And I suspect that embedded in the model is an assumption that political parties will select nominees who match certain preconceived notions of what candidates ought to look like and sound like when they're seeking a position once held by George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And that's why a Trump nomination would prove to be such a challenge. He is so non-traditional, so way out there, that he will prove to be a real test to these models that do not factor in personal characteristics. And if he were to win the nomination and lose in November, it would not be because of the campaign fundamentals, it would be solely because of his personal characteristics. So a Trump nomination, and I say this as a political scientist who thinks that forecasting models indicate some interesting and important things about our selection process, a Trump nomination would put a real strain on those models. And if Republicans want to win in November, then nominating Trump strikes me as a real gamble. So I think I've said enough, probably too much too fast, but it's emblematic of how interesting a presidential race we have this year, seemingly from start to finish. And although much of the game is typically over by this point in the process, we still have weeks to go before we enter the next phase, including vice presidential selection, although Cruz jumped the gun on that yesterday with Carly Fiorina. So I'm gonna stop here and open the floor for questions. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. What a fascinating time we have. Um, everybody on the webinar, along the right side of your screen, you should be able to ask questions um, and please start asking them and I will start uh, asking them for Dr. Crockett and we will start addressing those. All right, the first one we have. Has a third party candidate ever won an election? You could make an argument that the Republican Party was a third party in 1856, but they didn't win, so I'm going to say no to that. There's never been a third party candidate actually win the presidential election. And I'm going to try to get this question correct. If I don't ask it right, will you please respond again? Does a breakaway or doesn't a breakaway candidate from his party guarantee the election of the other party candidate? So I think he's probably referring to a breakaway third party factional effort. Let's, there's, there have been several examples in yeah. American history yeah. where a major party has a factional rift and a certain group of people in that party don't like who the party has nominated. Sometimes they don't float a third party candidate, they simply defect to the other party. But sometimes, probably the most famous case would be Teddy Roosevelt in 1912. They bolt the convention and find uh, their standard bearer 
some they think is pure and better. And in those situations, typically what happens is that party splits its vote and that hands the election to the opposite party. So in 1912, uh, Roosevelt and Taft split the Republican vote and that allowed Woodrow Wilson to walk into the White House with just over 40% of the popular vote. And that has happened several times in American history. Okay. How likely do you think a contested Republican convention is at this point? You know, about two weeks ago, I was said a very, very likely because most of the people I was looking at who were running the numbers and walking through the future primaries and what Trump would have to do, he had a really small needle to thread. And he really underperformed in Wisconsin badly, which means he, which meant he really had to do a whole lot better in New York and two days ago. Well, he did do a whole lot better in New York and two days ago, so he's basically used those two weeks to recover from his bad performance in Wisconsin. So it really does come down now to a week-by-week -week march where the question is, who wins Indiana next week? Who wins in the next four weeks? And if, and if he does, if there is any kind of momentum that builds up, if, if the sense of inevitability has led people to kind of move in mass in his direction, then I think it's highly possible that he'll have this thing locked up with the California primary on June the 7th. And whereas before I would say, you know, if I'm, I'm not a betting man, but if I were to say 60-40 or 70-30 in favor of a broker convention, now I'd probably say 50-50 at best and if he wins Indiana next Tuesday, we may see that dissipate, which is unfortunate for some of us. As some of us dream of a, con of a contested convention because we haven't seen one in decades. But um, uh, if Trump is the deal maker he claims to be, even if he's short of just by a few delegates, he'll be able to pick him up in that 40-day interregnum. And so the, the, the burden is on Cruz and Kasich to do everything they can to prevent him from acquiring delegates sufficient in number to get him past 1,200, because if he's only short by three dozen, I think, I think he can make that up. But if he's hanging around 1050 or 1100, then that's going to be, make a, a, a broker convention or a contested convention more likely. I'm not as optimistic right. as I was. <laughs> uh, is there a path for Sanders third for a Sanders third party bid? I don't think so. You know, third parties have to start early. He has said he's not going to do that, and so I'll trust politicians until they prove me otherwise. But, for example, to even get on the ballot in Texas, you'd have to be doing that right now. You have about two more weeks to get the necessary numbers, uh, you know, names on a uh, petition sheet. So some of these ballot access barriers are very prohibitive for a third party candidate. And I think Sanders's more likely route is to try to use his support and the enthusiasm of the people who support him to get something from Hillary Clinton at the convention, either force the platform more left than she would like or, or force her to articulate a more staunchly progressive, uh, to a certain extent that's, that's happened a little bit, but to, but to try to force her and the party in a more progressive direction. He might use his delegate strength to do that. They're going to have to give him a speaking role. There's too much enthusiasm behind him to deny him that. Uh, so I don't see how he goes the third party route. All right. Can you speak some more to Trump's electability in the general election pending Hillary Clinton successfully taking the Democratic nomination? Yeah, if you look at that situation, again, the models, I think, would indicate a Republican opportunity for a variety of reasons, but Trump as an individual creates issues. Everyone in the Republican Party establishment after 2012 thought, we've just got to do better with women and Hispanics, and we need to figure out how to, to do that. And the Trump candidacy takes that, wads it up in a ball, and throws it in the trash can. Uh, so he has, you know, even though he comes out after the uh, primaries on Tuesday and says that Hillary Clinton does horribly with women and he does great with women, the fact of the matter is he does horribly with women and he does horribly with Hispanics. You're already seeing news stories about record numbers of Hispanics registering to vote and they're not doing that because they want to vote for Donald Trump. And so it's not that he's going to lose a bunch of states that Republicans would only win. I, I feel pretty confident, for example, that a Donald Trump would take Texas. But to win in November, the Republican nominee has to pick off some purple states that Obama won twice. And that's states like Ohio and Florida 
in maybe Iowa, maybe pick off Pennsylvania, and I have to ask myself the question, which of these states does Trump take away from Hillary Clinton? If he, could, if he does so poorly in minority votes, Hispanic votes, and the women votes, uh, women voting. So I think that's real, the real problem is, and, and it's not just people who are voting for Hillary Clinton pushed there by Donald Trump, it's also so, a certain faction of Republicans who will not vote for him. And to a certain extent, Republicans have put themselves in an awkward position this time where no matter who gets the nomination, a certain faction is going to be really, really upset and probably stay home. Not that they're going to vote for Hillary Clinton, they just won't come out and vote. So if Donald Trump is denied the nomination and Ted Cruz gets it, a lot of Trump supporters won't vote for him. And if Trump gets the nomination, there's a certain faction of Republicans who won't vote for him because they see him as unacceptable. And, um, and again, it's not that they would vote for Hillary Clinton, though some might, but they just may not vote at all. And everyone who doesn't vote who normally would, it's really a vote for Hillary Clinton, and that's the danger. It's not so much that he would lose red states, although I think he might put some red states into play for Democrats, but I don't know that he wins enough purple states to overcome that gap that Obama created in 2008 and in 2012. And I'm just hard pressed to see how he does that if he has such historic, I mean, he, he's got, I know Hillary Clinton has really high negatives, and she perhaps has historically high negatives, but he has the historically highest negatives of any major party candidate in the history of public opinion polling. In an election year that Republicans ought to be advantaged, that's not how you want to go into the November election. So what exactly is the nativist sentiment being currently exploited by Trump as a result of the Republican Tea Party strategy after the 2008 election? Um, you know, I think of the Tea Party, they're really a reaction to, in part, the Bush presidency, who was not sufficiently conservative for a lot of conservatives, and the opening days of the Obama presidency as they saw where they saw the country was going. And so initially it seemed to me that the Tea Party was more classically small government, uh, cutting taxes but cutting programs and not necessarily overtly nativist, but obviously Trump has tapped into a concern about the role of illegal immigrants in the country and other forces like that. And I don't know how much of that is tied directely to the Tea Party, because when you look at someone like Ted Cruz, uh, he is a more natural candidate for Tea Party supporters than Trump is, but then Ted Cruz has the same kind of rhetoric about immigration that Trump does. They were actually allies not too many months ago uh, before Cruz threatened Trump and Trump started questioning his, uh, his uh, natural born bona fides. So I don't know how much of that is Tea Party as much as it might be a building sentiment in a certain faction of the Republican Party that sees part of this through perhaps a culture war lens or Trump mobilizing people who have not been solidly Republican voters, uh, like uh, white working class voters who in, back in the day would have been Democrats or Reagan Democrats, and, uh, and that might be someone that he's trying to bring back into the party. Not a good answer to your question, I'm afraid, but uh, it's not clear to me how much of that is exactly key party related. How do you see the different candidates' influence on the Senate and Congress balance? So this is a really important question. In the Senate, Republicans are defending twice as many seats as Democrats. And that means they're more vulnerable to losing more seats. And a lot of Republican office holders fear that a Trump candidacy, maybe even a Cruz candidacy, and you have two candidates here who are flawed general election candidates, but a Trump candidacy, if he really becomes a general election disaster, would give coattails to Hillary Clinton. And in any state that's vulnerable, and you've got states like Illinois and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania come immediately to my mind, and New Hampshire, there are at least four Republicans right there, senators running for re-election in states that are in the balance. And so if Hillary Clinton takes those states, then it's quite possible Republicans would lose those Senate candidates. And you don't need that many for them to lose control of the Senate. That's the real risk. In the House, it's more of an open question. Republicans are at historic highs in the, in the, in the House, 
they haven't had numbers this strong since the 1920s. And so Democrats have to pick off about 30 House seats, and that's a pretty tall order. But there have been elections in the past, as recently as 2006 and 2008, where if there's a wave building, if there's a real anti-Trump phenomenon, if, if two-thirds of the country really doesn't like him and you have Hillary Clinton cresting 55 or 56 or 57 percent of the popular vote, then you may see a wave take out 30 or 40 Republican seats and they lose control of the House as well. So it wouldn't surprise me. I think, I think sitting office holders come September will take a very coldly analytical look at the general election and they may do what, what they did in 1996. In 1996, Newt Gingrich and other Republicans assessed the situation and thought there's no way Bob Dole is going to beat Bill Clinton. So they did not support Bob Dole at all. They rallied their forces to defend their majorities in Congress, and they did so, they did so successfully, basically throwing Dole uh, off the bus. And uh, that's what could happen this fall. If Republicans in Congress see their majorities threatened by a Trump candidacy, they will not support that candidacy. They will not campaign with Trump. They'll do everything to distance themselves from Trump in an effort to try to preserve their majorities. And that's the danger, I think, that Trump poses. And again, it's not just Trump. Republicans are going in vulnerable in the Senate no matter who the nominee is. But what they want is a nominee who can win, because if a, if a Republican wins the presidency in November, I think they keep their majorities in both houses. But if a, if a Republican loses in November, then I think the Senate is in real danger. And depending on how big a wave develops, the House could be in danger, too. Great. Is Donald Trump's populism and message that the system is rigged going to spell an end to the state's caucuses system, and will we only will we only have primaries as a result? That's a possibility. You know, every time a party no. If he loses, it'll be a possibility. If Donald Trump wins and Republicans have the golden age in the next four years because he'll make, he makes America great again, then they won't change anything, although he might change it because of the force of his personality. But every time a party loses a presidency, they usually do some introspection and figure out was there anything systematic or structural about our nomination process that, that uh, hurt us. And both parties tend to tweak the system a little here and there. And clearly, Donald Trump's, and, and to a certain extent Bernie Sanders as well, their agitation over some of these rules questions have raised the profile of these issues. And you may begin to see a move away from caucuses in favor of these primaries, for better or for worse. And I don't know how much of this is better or not, but I think it's possible you could see that. Certainly the winner gets to write the rules in their favor. And if Donald Trump wins the presidency, he gets to put his person in as the head of the RNC and they can fiddle with the rules all he wants, and because he won a certain way, he can change the rules the way he wants to. Uh, so that's a possibility. All right, I'm gonna see if I get this one right. If the Democrats win the presidency and the Congress takes over as more primarily Democratic, what happens with the Supreme Court being substantially liberal? Can they change the Second Amendment? <laughs> they can't change the Second Amendment, but they can change the interpretation of the Second Amendment. So you have a situation, obviously, right now where Republicans seem to be holding on to their uh, their guns when it comes to the uh, the opening created by Anthony Scalia's death. And so, if you go into November and they still haven't replaced that uh, individual, then if Democrats win, that's going to be a no-brainer. It may be someone relatively moderate like uh, the individual that uh, President Obama nominated, but it could be a Hillary Clinton might say, I don't want that person, I'm gonna find someone even more progressive. And it's hard for me to see how they can block that for four straight years. And that means the center of gravity on the Supreme Court shifts dramatically. Even with a moderate pick, Anthony Kennedy was the, centrist, the center vote when Scalia was alive. And with a left of center centrist vote, that puts that individual, not Anthony Kennedy, as the center vote. And that shifts everything to the left. And you would assume that things like Citizens United, the, uh, the interpretation of the Second Amendment from the DC versus Heller case, 
all those cases could be in question if the right kind of case comes before the Supreme Court. And you would expect then for the Supreme Court to veer toward the left on those issues. And uh, rather than an interpretation that says that the Second Amendment uh, guarantees an individual the right to keep and bear arms, they would probably interpret the Second Amendment as a more collective right uh, and that states are free to regulate this more dramatically than they have uh, recently. So it wouldn't be that you would lose the Second Amendment, but I'm sure fair Second Amendment supporters would argue that for all practical purposes, you would lose the Second Amendment. So uh, that would certainly be a potential danger if you're worried about those kinds of things. Okay, we're going to wrap up with just a few more questions. Um, is there any validity to the argument that Cruz should not be able to run for presidency as he was born in Canada? I don't really think so. Uh, in my mind, the best way to look at this is that if you are Amer an American citizen, you are either an American citizen because you're natural born, or at some kind of time in your life, you had to take a citizenship oath, a naturalization oath. And as far as I understand it, Ted Cruz is today a citizen, and he's never had to take a naturalization oath. And that means he is a natural born citizen. So I don't think that's gonna to be a, too big of a problem. Um, is there any role for Marco Rubio to play? Yeah, possibly. You know, he's actually made dramatic efforts to try to keep control of his delegates. The, the, the extent to which a candidate can, can, can control his delegates is somewhat limited, but he hasn't released them and he hasn't ended his campaign. He has merely suspended his campaign. So if the convention changes rules to allow other people who have acquired delegates to be to have their name put in, into nomination, his name could be put into nomination. And the idea here is you, you end up with a train wreck at the convention. Let's imagine a scenario where Trump doesn't get to 1237. He's 150 behind. And after the first ballot, he just can't make any ground. He's actually lost ground. But Ted Cruz can't make up that ground either. Well, the reason for these peculiar rules that allow delegates to become free agents is that if you have a deadlock convention, something has to break. And that means the delegates have to be free to look elsewhere, and it may be on ballot 10, 12, 15, or 20. I mean, in 1924, the Democrats went 103 ballots, uh, God forbid. But it may, it may take that long, but they would look elsewhere, and someone like Rubio, for example, could be the person who becomes the consensus third choice and enough to allow a nominee to come forth. So that's one way he could play a, a, a role. And the second way he could play a role is to be a kingmaker. Let's imagine a situation where Trump is short by 50 to 100, and Cruz makes up a lot of the difference, but not enough. And maybe the 100 plus that Rubio has would allow Cruz to go over the top if Rubio cuts his delegates free and says, I'd like you to vote for Cruz. In that kind of a situation, uh, Rubio becomes the kingmaker, maybe because he's been promised a, a cabinet position or something like that. He can't, he can't be, he can promise the vice presidency anymore because Cruz has already done that, but he can be promised something else in the cabinet and keep his political future alive. And so in that sense, Rubio could play a role. Do you think there are enough closet Trump supporters out there to carry him to a win in November? No, I don't. I think the enthusiastic Trump supporters are the ones who are coming out in the primaries. And the problem is you see people talking about historic numbers and the turnout in the primary. And that's true. And Trump has won more votes now than any Republican in history. Now, some of that's a stupid argument because every four years we have more people in the country and therefore more people voting. So you'd expect to have the next candidate win more votes than the previous candidate. But the number of people who vote in primaries and caucuses is vanishingly small compared to the number of people who come out in November. So if you think about a Trump-Clinton contest in November, as depressing as that might be to some people, it might actually be a turnout generator and there'll be many, many times more people coming out to vote in November than voted in the primaries. And so if Trump has done his main work generating support in the primaries, he may already have that support there. It doesn't mean that there are five times that many closet Trump supporters out there in the country. So I really, uh, you need to prove that to me, and of course a Trump victory in November would do that. But right now I'm going to put my trust in the polls that suggest that he has very high negatives, 
and there not, is not going to be a big wave of African Americans and Latinos and women coming to support him. And uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know where these people are. And if there are some of them out there, one of the problems is they may be in states he's already going to win. Maybe there, maybe there are a few million more closet Trump fans in Texas and in Nebraska and places like that. But are they in Pennsylvania, Florida, Ohio, and places like that? And I'm not convinced of that. So again, we, we could be proven wrong. Uh, we could have 80% turnout this November because Trump just drew uh, a royal flush. But um, that's his rhetoric. But uh, his rhetoric is a mix of uh, balderdash and bombast. All right. Thank you, Dr. Crockett, for your fascinating insight. I also wanted to mention you have a shout out from the Big Island of Hawaii. <laughs> have a group there watching you. Got up super early to be on the webinar. Wow. So they wanted to say hi. Hello. Um, Aloha. Also, thank you to all the alumni across the world, including to the Big Island, that joined us today for our Tiger Enrichment Lifelong Learning Series. Trinity's motto is discover, grow, become. This webinar series for alumni gives us all the opportunity to stay engaged and connected with Trinity and continue with lifelong learning no matter where we live. So be sure to join us on June 28th for the next Tiger Enrichment Lifelong Learning webinar with Barbie O'Connor who's going to share seven things you need to do to effectively manage your personal finances and pay off your student loan debt. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. Thank you.